Now, most of you wouldn't have noticed that we were off air last week. We certainly didn't. We were too busy making this week great again. Yes, we've cut our tenuous ties with the lily-livered li liberal lefty BBC Yentobs and signed up with the award-winning Trump TV network, where we'll be appreciated, bigly. Placed on prime time and no longer consigned to the wee small hours of a Friday morning, wedged between the increasingly out-of-the-question time <laughs> and the news night shipping forecast. The changes are going to be huge, folks. For starters, we'll no longer be running with the sheeple or of the evil mainstream media herd, those supposed reliable experts now looking total Charlies after the Donald's victory. You know who I mean. Pollsters, pundits, financial markets, cultural elites. Did I mention pollsters? Expert sophologists, pollsters, more pollsters, and even a magic goat in Scotland that Michael is especially fond of. At least Michael didn't listen to the goat because our boy was the only sentient pundit who foresaw the Trump victory, which just goes to show that all these endless train journeys aren't a waste of time after all. Actually, they are. I was just being nice. It was a lucky guess. Anyway, here with the humble pie is Tom Walker, or as you probably know him, Jonathan Pie, with his take of the week. Morning, Tim. Morning. Howdy. How was Washington? 18 months ago, I was an unemployed actor struggling to pay my rent. I had two options, become a political satirist or go on the game. I chose the former. And so, fake news reporter Jonathan Pye was born. Trump, the pussy-grabbing, wall-building, climate-change-denying, healthcare-abolishing, tax-dodging, shit-spewing demagogue. How shit have you got to be to lose to that? He's got a bad temper, a little bit like this lot, a left-wing chip on his shoulder and a vocabulary that would make Malcolm Tucker blush. He's a political correspondent who can't talk about politics without getting angry, and that is the basic comedic and satirical conceit. How many times does the vote not have to go our way before we realise that our argument isn't won by hurling labels and insults? Tory majority, government, uh, Brexit, uh, uh, Trump. What next? When will we learn that the key is discussion? I'm just a little bit more rouge, please. Thanks. Like Pi, I was surprised and disappointed with the UK referendum result, but following it, I watched as some of my friends, many of them self-proclaimed liberals, went on social media declaring, if you voted leave, unfriend me now. The narrative from my Facebook feed was that anyone that voted leave was a racist, bigot, and most definitely stupid. This reaction to the referendum changed my view of what it means to be on the left, and that in turn has informed the character. that voted for Trump is a sexist or a racist. Some of them are, but most aren't. Most people didn't vote for her, not because she's a woman. They didn't vote for her because she offered no palpable change whatsoever. Pye argues that to simply label the majority of Trump voters as sexist or bigoted just isn't helpful and doesn't help to advance the debate. If anything, it shuts the debate down and that can be dangerous. How do you think people are going to vote if you talk to them like that? When has anyone ever been persuaded by being insulted or, or labelled? So now, if you're on the right or even against the prevailing view, you are attacked for raising your opinion. That's why people wait until they're in the voting booth. Oh, shut up, you dick. The piece has sparked much debate. It's also ruffled a few feathers. I'm not surprised the character is dogmatic and self-righteous, which is why he's so much fun to play and hopefully so much fun to watch. But the main objection that I've heard again and again coming from the left is this, that I cannot possibly understand the impact of Trump's victory, especially on minority groups, so I should probably just keep quiet. And the reason? Because I'm a straight white male. Donald Trump. The left is responsible for this result because the left have now decided that any other opinion, any other way of looking at the world is unacceptable. The irony is, is that rejecting Pi's argument on the basis of identity politics reinforces the very point the piece of satire was attempting to highlight. That by dismissing someone's opinion or vote, by using labels such as sexist, racist or stupid or even straight white male, you're more likely to lose an argument or an election that might more easily have been won through engagement and debate. No imagination or expense spared with allocations this week. That's our newsroom. <laughs> Jonathan Pye, I mean, Tom Walker's with us now. Welcome to the programme. Pleasure to be here. Michael, why did Trump win? 
Um, because a lot of people in America were fed up and angry and hadn't had a pay rise for a very long time and felt that they were the victims of, of globalization. Uh, and also a lot of people hated uh, Hillary. Is it the left now in crisis? Well, it doesn't have to be. Um, then is it? Uh, uh, I'm not sure yet. Um, I think people are still coming to terms with what's happened. I think he, he won because he had a very simple, clear message that connected with people emotionally and with their concerns about jobs and security. And I think, you know, I was a big Hillary supporter, but I think she, she didn't have that kind of message of being a change candidate. But she couldn't um, be the change candidate. She was the establishment candidate. But what's interesting is actually her policies of huge investment in infrastructure, tax rises That's on the rich and childcare, mm. were, were very different from previous candidates uh, from the left. But I think the big lesson for the left here is you can never, ever take your voters for granted. Well, Demography isn't destiny, and that's what I think we learned in this election. Why is the mainstream left, from France to Britain to the United States, losing the support of the traditional working class? Uh, because, I mean, as I think I point, point out there, or because I, I think that uh, uh, occasionally the, the working class is, you, you, you know, we, I talk about there about, about identity politics mm. and, and, uh, and, and some, in some areas of the left, that, that is the main point of ident yes. identity politics. Now, if you're poor and disenfranchised, um, when you walk into a voting booth, you... you um, <laughs> the issues of identity politics aren't actually at the forefront. It's about social, uh, uh, it's, it's your economic. Circumstances. Absolutely, absolutely. Opportunities Oppor for your kids. Without a doubt. And, and, and um, it, it, those sort of issues aren't important to you. Yeah, you, you want to provide for your oh. children. The idea that, that everyone that voted for Trump is a, is a sexist or a racist or a misogynist, no. What, you, what people are trying to do is actually provide for their family and provide for their, for, for their hasn't children. Hasn't Tom got a point there, Liz? Hasn't the left become too obsessed with identity politics? And, unless, of course, if your identity happens to be white working class. We do have an issue with our white working class vote. I mean, um, this is something... I talked about in my very unsuccessful leadership bid uh, the last time round and when I talked about the fact you were never going to give opportunities for our so-called traditional working class votes unless you um, address the underperformance of white working class boys, I was accused of dog whistle politics, mm. including by uh, a former occupant on the sofa. And by the people who won. <laughs> and and in, indeed. And the point is, we cannot be... Afraid. It's not that you have to agree with everything that's said. Absolutely. You have to listen and understand. If I knock it's... on a door, someone opens it and I rant at them, they'll tell me, go away, I'm putting the tea on, love. It's, it's you know, you have to be able to It's understand. about engagement. Uh, and it's about engaging with people that uh, that you might think that mm. think differently to you. And I think that's the point I'm trying to make, is that labelling someone... Uh, there was an article in The Guardian today that said that people that voted... that Why did women vote for Trump? And The Guardian's take on it was that, well, women can be misogynistic too. <laughs> and you think, well, you're shutting those people down. You're not I, talking to them. You're not I, listening to them. And, and I think that's really dangerous. It's about engagement, I think. I, I think this is what we're saying, but I just want to make clear that I think what's happened is that the left has moved away from the electorate rather than the electorate moving away from the left. So, for example, in this country, it was always the case that a very large proportion of Labour voters had quite right-wing views. They were, you know, pretty right-wing on things like immigration. And they crime. Were pretty, and... and crime, and they were pretty patriotic and so on. And, you know, old Labour characters like uh, David Blunkett, for example, in Sheffield, who was, you know, really rather a right-wing figure in many ways, perfectly understood his working-class electorate. But it doesn't seem, for example, in a Jeremy Corbyn uh, administration or leadership, that there is much understanding of that electorate. And I think a similar thing has happened in the United States. Mm. I mean, it, it, you know, Hillary didn't find a way of talking to that part of the electorate that mm. used to vote Democrat, but which could by no manner of speaking be described as left-wing. I think that what happened in America has kind of crystallised things in, in a way, as America often does, because it's such a big place and things tend to happen uh, more clearly there. But, and I look at Hillary Clinton or Ed Miliband or Francois Hollande. 
and they show that there's now there's a huge cultural divide between the left leadership and working class voters yes. mm. and for many people the deplorables as mrs clinton called them that cultural divide is now more important than class yeah i i think that is true one thing I would say is Jeremy has recognised that people on the economic issues, people feeling left out and left behind and not benefiting from globalisation. He's been very clear about that. But what the left does struggle is, is with those social issues. You see in the yes. States, I mean, people uh, he feeling... Went, he went out of his way, didn't he, to say he wasn't going to control immigration. I think you're going to lose so many seats in the North but England it, just on that one state. It's much wider than that. You know, certainly in the States, people who be, believe in faith, flag and family mm -hmm. feel that that is sneered at by the Liberal Well, they do. But it's not just the Liberal, it's the cultural elite. I mean, the thing that I noticed most of all uh, was, was how the cultural superiority of the coastal elites, people just found it insufferable and they rebelled it against it. And they then found Hillary Clinton, who was the poster politician for these coastal elites, unbearable. Despite Something really interesting ha has happened with, with this piece that I put out and that, that has gone that has gone um, you know viral. A huge amount of messages that I'm getting, and I don't know if this is this is um, telling or not. That a huge amount of messages that I've received have been from stalwart Sanders supporters, mm. and they were with him every step of the way, and hundreds of messages telling me I put my cross next to Trump and that they were more willing to vote for a supposed misogynistic uh, um, bigoted candidate rather than vote for the political elite and I think that is really telling it's not necessarily a narrative that we're hearing but I think it's at least <laughs> it, it's a, it's a, it's fascinating to me that people would vote for Trump rather than the political elite yeah. when they were crying out yeah. for a liberal candidate, and I think that bodes well for well, for your leader. Actually, well, some were crying out for him. You see, Jeremy Corbyn said, has said the, the, talking about the American elections, he said that the, the support of Bernie Sanders and the, the God in the U.S. the left parties in Spain, he says, where a clear alternative is offered, there is a buy-in to that. Well, here's the problems. Sanders lost. Mm -hmm. Podemos in Spain has produced the return mm -hmm. of a conservative government. The French socialists are about yeah. to be wiped out. Your party's lost Scotland. It could lose the north of England and you could be out for a generation. So I don't understand where Mr Corbyn's analysis well, takes us. I don't believe that Bernie Sanders would have won. Um, you know, he didn't have a single attack ad thrown at him. Actually, one of his closest no. allies, Russ Feingold in Wisconsin, lost the Senate race by a greater margin than Hillary. And he, you know, if he struggled to get out the African-American vote in the primaries, which is why he lost the nomination to Hillary in the first place, he wouldn't have got more out there. So I don't think that that is the solution. It and trying to have this segmented <laughs> approach where you appeal to one bit of an electorate rather than trying to find out what most people care about which is a decent job living you know growing up in security having opportunities for your kids this segmented approach won't work it the, didn't work at the, the last the election Re and the republicans the would have run attack ads against him showing him praising fidel castro and bigging up europe versus america mm -hmm. the idea that that was a winning formula does the left have a clue anywhere outside canada uh, not that I can immediately think of. I mean, just, just to underline what's happened in Spain, it is true that there was a new left-wing party, but it, is, it has lost ground. The mainstream left-wing party, the Socialists, mm. has, been, ha, has been beaten pretty badly, has lost uh, a million votes between one election and the next. And as you say, the right's in power. So, no, it's, it's hard to think of where the left is doing well. Final I th word I, on that issue? For I you? think that what the left need to do is, is really introspective look at themselves and look where they're going wrong and that I mean that means involves asking themselves some serious questions um, whether you agree with with what I put out there it's clearly resonated with with huge amounts of people um, and whether we the left come to the conclusion that actually identity politics or, or whatever um, isn't damaging that's fine but but there's got to be some serious questions to be asked because the left keep losing and and also um, b because I, my view is is because people on the right they don't say what they think until they're in the voting booth mm. and you can't 
persuade people unless you know what they feel. Right. And I think that that is the problem with the we've left, is, is that, that they are stifling, dis often they stifle discussion. We've had shy Tories, we've had bashful Brexiteers, and yes. now we've had timid Trump at this. Yes. I was going to mention how useless celebrity endorsements are now. Mrs Clinton had all of them from TV, Hollywood, music. It only underlined the cultural difference. I was also going to mention for a change posters and perhaps say that both the endorsements and the posters should be thrown in the dustbin together. But we've run out of time, but I think I managed to squeeze it in. Tom, thank you very much. Good oh, to it's see a pleasure you to be here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.